Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Dan Hausman, and I'm here with John Buse and Kaisa Quist. Uh, John's from the University of North Carolina, and Kaisa is from Novo Nordisk. Um, we're here to talk about the N3C and especially focus on how life sciences companies and other commercial groups can work and collaborate with the academic community to do interesting projects that are beneficial for patients around COVID. Um, so maybe John, could you introduce yourself a bit about your background? Uh, yes, I'm a diabetes clinical trialist. Uh, I have been working in the field for about 30 years. I also play the role of uh, uh, co-PI of the CTSA grant at the University of North Carolina um, and was involved very early with Melissa Handel and others in, um, in putting together the N3C collaboration and now work with the uh, so-called diabetes obesity task team that's actually leveraging the N3C enclave to, to do science. And how about you, Kaisa? Yeah, so my name is Kaisa. I'm working from Novo Nordisk. I have a background in statistics and now heading up a small unit uh, in, that does uh, data science in connection to real world data, uh, especially. And uh, my, I got introduced to N3C to John Buse. Um, I read a paper about the uh, differential outcomes of COVID in after different drug therapies and reached out to, to John who connected me to, uh, to Melissa and this ambitious and exciting endeavor. Excellent. Um, so, so what's your team at Novo Nordisk looking to do with the COVID-19 and the N3C? Uh, so the overall intention for my team is basically to support clinicians and patients living with serious chronic diseases and uh, since the vast majority of data available to us is in the area of type 2 and diabetes, uh, this is, of course, where we have our focus. And in connection to COVID, uh, there is so much information continuously being published. So we just wanted to, to do some high quality, uh, use some high quality data to, to support the treatment of type 2 diabetics in, the, in connection with COVID-19. And, and the potential differential impact uh, on COVID-19 outcomes, depending on various anti-diabetic um, treatment regimens. And, and, and how is the, the real world data really helping you here? So for the moment, uh, at least from my point of view, there is uh, no uh, large scale data sources other than real world data. And the, an RCT in this setting would have to be uh, very long and very large to answer questions uh, on outcomes. So the availability of high quality real world data is uh, essential. And with the potential of allowing us to draw similar conclusions, but substantially faster uh, and to the benefit of, uh, of our patients. And I think in general, real world data is of major relevance because it gives us insights as to how patients uh, are using our therapies um, and how they perform in the real world as opposed to the more uh, controlled setting of an, of an RCT, randomized controlled trial. And, and maybe, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, maybe I could just jump in a second. I mean, I think as a clinician, um, the problem has been that most of the publications that address the important clinical questions that we could do something about today, namely, I as a doctor, when I see my patients uh, later this afternoon, um, are there things that I would know from the literature that I could say, look, if we do this today, if you do get COVID-19, I would hope that you would have a better outcome for having done this today. There's very little we can say with certainty, mostly because even though there are literally thousands of papers that arguably are relevant to that decision making, most of them are either very small, you know, dozens to a few hundred patients, um, or they're single center experiences, or they occurred in uh, healthcare systems outside the United States where the dynamics of the epidemic were very different and certainly didn't reflect the, the treatment of today, including remdesivir and 
um, and steroids. And so that's the beauty of N3C is it's real time data um, and relevant to the United States. And it uh, you know, includes hundreds of thousands of patients with COVID-19. So it's, it's a huge data set. So I, I think, um, you know, I have lots of questions, but minimal skills. Uh, Kaja has lots of questions, but she has great skills. Um, and so it's fun to work together. Uh, and frankly, there's this diabetes obesity task team that I mentioned. It's now about a dozen or so people that get together once a month and try and uh, and, and come up with what the important questions are. Yeah, and, and I was going to ask John, so you know, what do you sort of see as the benefits for working with a commercial group um, collaborating with your team? Uh, you know, I think uh, the big problem for investigators um, today um, is that everybody had a full-time job before COVID-19. And so now whenever we have a sort of COVID-19 interest, we have to sort of squeeze that in on top of what was a pretty demanding career to begin with. Um, you know, the folks at Novo Nordisk have amazing skills, um, but on top of that, they also have um, some time and energy to devote to this. So uh, frankly, the analyses that we're doing, we couldn't have, we just couldn't do without them. Both because of their skills, but also uh, being able to devote time to the effort. Um, and and, and Kaiser, you've been working with, with John and, and the rest of the team in N3C. Sort of what have you found, you know, beyond the data you've gotten out of the relationship? Oh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's been absolutely uh, an amazing uh, opportunity. Uh, I think it's fantastic with the, I mean, the, all the, the, the whole setup, all the people that you get to know, the meetings, the discussions, listening to research hypotheses from a range of, of fields. And, and um, so the opportunity to learn from my point of view and my team has been, has been, has been amazing. Uh, discussing the data set up for the very sort of hardcore data scientists and then learning uh, from other areas, being part of, a, of the journey has been, um, has been amazing. And, and to John's point, then I think that, that coming with uh, a, a commercial entity like Novo Nordisk in the back, there is just a lot of resources to tap into that can be sort of diverted into, uh, into to doing high quality science in this aspect. And, you know, one thing we forgot to mention, Kaisa, is, uh, you know, the other real magic to our little effort um, is that we also have a MD PhD student involved, Anna Kokoska. Um, and, uh, you know, she happens to be in a stage in her career where she's got some time and very smart, very efficient. And um, so yeah, the other special ingredient is having trainees involved who, you know, who also have a really deep interest in answering important questions. Um, and so she has done a lot of the heavy lifting with regards to the actual writing of protocols, um, the actual um, drafting of what we hope will be a paper soon. Um, you know, Kaja's team has done the vast majority of the analysis. Um, and then the other clinicians, they're bringing questions and trying to make things real um, um, in the effort. So it, you know, I don't think this would happen without this team being together and, and the resource to work on is obviously the most important ingredient. Um, so in terms of the process to get involved and maybe if there are any barriers, what they look like, can, can you just describe what it took to get started and running, Kasha? Um, so as, as, as I initiated, then uh, John uh, informed me about this ambitious, uh, exciting endeavor that uh, has been, that is the N3C. And then I, I mean, as, as COVID in, in the spring was, was, was and is new to us, so was N3C. So of course there were, I mean, there's some initial, you know, hiccups figuring out who to talk to and how to do, but otherwise I think it's been, it, it's amazing the way, the speed with which data comes in, the cleaning, the pe amount of people you can talk to and get advice from and, and the sharing of, uh, of, of where you are in the different task force, task teams, um, so I think it's been, it's an amazing to be part of. It, it really is sharing best practices and, and learning from each other. 
Um, and from our point, we haven't had any, any issues or technical challenges getting started. I mean, the, the short answer, you know, particularly for somebody from the pharmaceutical industry that wants to get involved, it's about making a data use request. Um, you can do that online. It's, uh, you know, there, there's nothing that difficult um, about it. Um, if you want to do it in the context of one of the task teams, there are now about, I don't know, 15 or so task teams that are focused in diff different areas. Ours is diabetes and obesity, but they have some that are on chronic kidney disease, heart disease, social determinants of health, pharmacoepidemiology. I mean, there's a bunch. Um, the clinicians are looking for people to, to help answer the questions. Um, they're more clinicians involved and fewer people that are actually, you know, have skills with regards to, um, you know, developing the code and doing the analyses. Um, you know, we also have a fair number of hardcore informaticians that are less good at sort of developing the questions. So it's a, um, it's a village and there's plenty of room for more people to participate. And, and Kaiser, what have you learned so far? I mean, have you, have you learned in the process either some, some early results or at least even things you should or shouldn't do to, to make this work well? Okay, so I think that it's, it's, it is really an amazing thing uh, to set out there to the world to be used if you have the time and it's open to all of us and we can get in and investigate our research hypothesis so I would say, you know, the learning is that it's there and, and it gets better the more who uses it because uh, it is like open software that uh, just becomes better the more people who uses it and develops it. Uh, and it's continuously growing at an alarming rate. And what do you see happening next, the next six months or so, you know, seeing as COVID still in full, full swing in, in, in Europe and the US? <laughs> And what kind of research might change from what you originally tried to do? From from our side, well, so we we have uh, we set out uh, you know three uh, as I see it relevant uh, questions, and we are now well on the way with the first one and writing a paper. And then I hope that everybody still wants to join and will continue on to the next ones. And 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 from from Nova's point of view, you know, we learn more about the indications that we focus on. We learn more about our products, so we can deliver better products. And then we get more details about the data, more information about the patients. So maybe it will be more detailed uh, niche hypotheses that we step into after these first three ones that we put up and agreed to in the, in John's task team. Yep. Okay. I think the other thing that's going to be really important moving forward, I mean, even if they develop a drug that just absolutely clears people, um, even if we have a vaccine tomorrow, um, there's still this issue of the long-term effects of COVID-19. And because the N3C enclave will continue to have data contributed on the people who have already had COVID for the next five years, um, I think there is a long-term project to understand the long-term consequences and, you know, are there certain practices that are associated with better outcomes or worse outcomes in the long run? So, you know, even if the, the pandemic ends tomorrow, um, the resource is going to be very valuable for years to come. Yeah. Thanks. Um, was there anything you'd like to leave the audience with in terms of a thought or, or an action they could take? Um, as we close out this podcast, um, either of you? Well, I think that, it, it, as repeat again, I think that the N3C is there and it gets better the more who uses it. And it really is an, an amazing uh, resource to tap into uh, for all the reasons that John just mentioned. And it's not too late to get involved. I mean, the, I think we have learned a lot in working with it over the last three months. And um, you know, and what I would say is, you know, it, it has been challenging. It um, isn't as easy as I hoped, but the truth of the matter is it would be easier to get involved today than it was three months ago. And two months from now, it still won't be too late um, and it'll just be easier still. And six months from now, um, you know, my guess is there'll be many, 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 many publications. And then the only challenging thing is, you know, how to think about how to think of something 
that isn't already being done, you know, once we have hundreds and thousands of people who are involved in the process. Um, so I, I think this is a great time to get involved. Great. And there is so, I mean, the now there's more than a million patients in there with, you know, high quality and, and detailed data. So the number of research hypotheses, even if the pandemic went tomorrow, away tomorrow is, it's a good resource. And it's free. Free, it's great. <laughs> I think I think I, I echo all of your thoughts that you know come along at least give it a try if you're in a commercial organization um, and then even if you're a citizen scientist you should come along and, and figure out ways to make this data useful. Um, there is a working group uh, Kaiser and I are both on it in terms of commercial groups that are interested so you can also join that if you're not sure where to go first um, and you'll see it on the website but please um, come along if you're listening to this podcast and and you know, start getting involved. But uh, John and, and Kaiser, thank you so much for, for joining me today. And I, I look forward to reading your research as it comes out. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs>